A decade before Night and Day was released, a movie like Night and Day would have killed with audiences. Come on, it starred Tom Cruise and Cameron Diaz and looked to perfectly mash humor and action in a way that so few male-female-led action comedies had for years, yet it didn't connect. But why? There are a lot of reasons, really, and it's not just, as Roy Miller would say, one of those things. Through lousy marketing, hokey promotion, poorly timed sneak previews, night and day fizzled. Less beautiful dress than beautiful mess. But it did at least inspire a Bollywood remake. So suck on that, Vanilla Sky. So, let's find out what the f happened to this movie. Night and Day began, as with so many Hollywood screenplays, as a spec script, or a work that is uncommissioned but written in hopes of selling it to a studio. Think Basic Instinct and Goodwill Hunting. And that screenplay was written by Patrick O'Neill, at least originally. And it was called All New Enemies, at least originally. And it was geared up to have landed an R rating, at least originally. This is one motorcycle you want to strap into because there are going to be a lot of screenwriters, a lot of title changes, and a lot of plot developments. In total, it's estimated that around 12 writers circled what would eventually morph into night and day, including Ocean's Eleven's Ted Griffin, the Bionic Woman remakes Lita Calagritis, and Mr. and Mrs. Smith's Simon Kinberg. While we may not know exactly what their individual contributions were, no doubt you can see marks of most of these movies and shows in the final version of Night and Day. The first title change came early enough when All New Enemies was retitled to Wichita, so named for where the movie starts, with Diaz's character having just made an auto parts deal there. Speaking of the Kansas City, the opening sequence was at one point set virtually, with Cruz and Diaz's characters meeting online. This, like so much else, would be ditched. Around this time, the movie was set up at Revolution Studios. But this too would be short-lived, moving over to Sony, where it was retitled yet again, Trouble Man. Now, let's chat directors. The original director was Gridiron Gang's Phil Jeannot, but when Sony bailed on the movie and Fox picked it up, in came Tom Day, director of Shanghai Noon and Failure to Launch. He eventually, directing duties would go to James Mangold, then best known for Walk the Line and 310 to Yuma. For Mangold, it was an opportunity to loosen up his filmography a bit and not worry about doing an Oscar caliber film. At Fox, Night and Day would be reworked seemingly constantly. One major focus for the studio was to develop a romance angle between the leads, something that seemed obvious back when the characters were changed from a male and younger co-star to two adults, a male and a female, a night and day as it were. They too brought in yet another writer. What happens in Vegas is Dana Fox. Yes, there were a lot of writers who had their pen in the ink, so much so that it was a long discussion with the Writers Guild of America over who would get final credit. Since it couldn't quite be determined who contributed the most significant portion of the script, final credit went back to original writer Patrick O'Neill. But playing off of Night and Day's numerous drafts, he said, I still don't know exactly what it's about. And that's what's so cool. What's even cooler? These two superstars reminding us why they're superstars. So, who would those superstars be? Well, that's about as deep as the revolving door of writers. One original star was Adam Sandler, attached back in the Wichita days around 2005. As for why he turned it down, he said, I just don't see me with a gun. He would instead lead Grown Ups, which unfortunately for Night and Day will come up a bit later in this episode. When it was Trouble Man at Sony, both Chris Tucker and Eva Mendez were tied to the lead roles. He eventually 
in came Cameron Diaz to play June Havens, while Gerard Butler circled the role of Roy Miller, aka Matthew Knight. He, however, would opt to do the bounty hunter opposite Jennifer Aniston instead. So, when does Tom Cruise enter? Well, once he ditched the lead role in Salt, which itself had a gender swap, with Angelina Jolie later taking the lead, and The Tourist, a role that a few actors were considered for, but eventually fell on Johnny Depp. Night and day would be Tom Cruise's chance for some redemption, as Lions for Lambs and Valkyrie were far from hits. His public reputation had slid dramatically too as he had taken to jumping on daytime talk show couches and blasting psychiatry and growing his Scientological ties, which probably played into Fox's poorly managed marketing campaign. As Mangold remembered it, in my totally selfish mind's eye, I could not imagine he was going to make any other choice. Night and Day too would give him the chance to get back into the action game. Not surprisingly, Cruz was very hands-on, bringing his trademark magnetism and presence to the process, helping develop his character into something it hadn't yet become despite so many drafts. He even brought some ideas to the action sequences, particularly when he has Diaz on a motorcycle and flips her onto his lap, something he had actually been wanting to do in a movie for quite some time. After all, he does love his motorcycles. In one key sequence, he remembered the stone road was very slick. That's why we chose that Ducati. The tires were good. It was lighter in weight than the super bikes. The heart was definitely pumping that morning. We have to imagine Cruz was sent at least one Ducati from the Italian manufacturer. Cruz was also so committed that he cut his salary nearly in half to, uh, just, 11 million dollars. He also didn't take box office residuals, that is until after investors got their cash back. And there were, as you probably figured out on the production history up to this point, a lot of studios. Dune Entertainment, New Regency, Pink Machine, Todd Garner Productions, Treeline Film, uh, we think that's all of them. Cameras on night and day, final title, we promise, finally rolled in September 2009 with a lot of the movies shot in Massachusetts, including Bedminster, where one of the movie's most dynamic scenes, the plane crash, was shot. Fox would even pay the fire department $30,000 for their efforts. Other locales included Los Angeles, Austria, and Jamaica, including one part that had been seen in 1988's Cocktail. Production on night and day had far fewer issues than pre and post, with most, Okay, some of the issues behind, Mangold, Cruz, and Diaz set out to make a fun, adult-geared movie that would feel loose and hopefully put Cruz back at the forefront of entertainment. As Mangold put it, what I didn't want was another film that felt so storyboarded so that it felt like a piece of machinery. I wanted to feel like we were finding the movie as we made it. He added, I just felt like there was a Tom I missed in the movies, the vulnerable side, the idea that six agents with Uzis might not make him blink, but a girl needing to talk about whether he missed her is hard. To see Tom have an unforgettable human moment is better than any special effect. And Cruz does indeed have many human moments in the movie, chiefly around his humor, which the star has really never been given proper credit for. As Diaz put it, Tom hasn't really gotten to be funny lately. We got to laugh a lot on this movie and blow shit up. But could it blow up the box office? Well, let's take a look at the marketing, which was completely mishandled by both the creatives and the suits. For example, one poster didn't even have Tom Cruise or Cameron Diaz's faces on it. As a co-president of Fox Marketing said, it was a way for us to signal that this was a different adult kind of movie. It wasn't in any way us trying to hide anyone, simply to make the film unique. But it was still like Fox didn't want to be too attached to their male lead, just in case his stigma carried through to the box office. There was even a weird marketing stunt designed solely to go viral. Never a good sign, by the way showing the dynamic between Cruz and Diaz, with Diaz kicking Cruz's chest. But this ended up being mocked for being forced and phony. 
According to Fox Domestic Distribution President Bruce Snyder, this is not as easy a sell as a sequel or a movie based on an existing property. We feel our best tool is to get word of mouth out on it. One way to do so was with a sneak preview a pre-release buzz tactic meant to boost numbers, something the studio knew night and day would need. After all, buzz was quiet. As Fox's marketing co-president Tony Sella put it, it was a problem with our message. The minute the bad tracking came out, we went into DEFCON 5 because the tracking never lies. We reacted almost daily in a way to make the campaign better, with different ideas and different spots. One move saw Fox opting to hold their preview on the Saturday before the movie opened. In short, having a poorly received preview so close to the wide release could kill the movie before it even hit theaters. According to another Fox distribution bigwig, it's an adult movie opening on a Wednesday, but we opened it there and snuck it on a Saturday because we believe the word of mouth will be good, so we're set for a pretty good opening weekend. Remember. It's an original adult movie, which we expect will run for quite a while. Night and Day had its world premiere on June 16th, 2010 in Seville, Spain, where a portion of the movie was shot. It opened one week later on June 23rd, making just $3.8 million on its first day. By the end of the weekend, Night and Day was number three at just $20.1 million, well below number two, Grown Ups. Consider this, Night and Day was actually moved up two days so as to get a leg up on the Sandler Ensemble. So much for that. And then Night and Day dropped to number five the next week, down to number seven the week after that, and finally out of the top 10 in its fifth week. With a budget pegged around $120 million, Night and Day would go on to make $76.4 million domestically, faring much better worldwide with another $185.5, bringing the total gross to $261.9 million. Later on, it took in $32.8 million in home video sales. Producer Steve Pink would later credit writer Patrick O'Neill and the characters, but also wondered, otherwise, I have no idea how it stayed alive. Had Night and Day come out, say, 10 years earlier, when Cameron Diaz could have rode her popularity and Charlie's Angels level action finesse, and Tom Cruise had a better reputation in the public eye, it might have been a major hit all around. Instead, it's something else entirely, a sort of wink for those that have even bothered watching it. Night and Day deserved a better marketing campaign, resulting in a lousy box office outing. But as they say, those who know, know. All around, Night and Day is a damn good movie. It's funny, it's nicely paced, the set pieces are a blast, the on-screen chemistry is palpable, it has everything going for it on the screen. As Fox production president Emma Fox put it, this is the kind of film that needs to be discovered, and I think it will be. Maybe someday it will. Then again, that's a dangerous word. Just hopefully not a code for never.